and get the recording started. All right, so this is Simple Actions to Help Birds. And I'm going to start my PowerPoint presentation back up and share a little bit of information with you about Denver Audubon, who we are. And then we'll start talking about the birds. So um, let me, there we go. So Denver Audubon is over 51 years old. We inspire actions to help birds, other wildlife, and their habitats through education, conservation, and research. So tonight, we hope to inspire you to take an action for the birds. We uh, have a lot of different types of programs that we, that we do. Oh, I forgot to say, um, talk to you about our chapters. We are a chapter of National Audubon, and we are an independent chapter, which means that we are not affiliated with them. We do not receive any, um, any like salary or funding or anything from National Audubon. It is a separate organization. So when you join National Audubon and get their beautiful magazine, we get like, I think pennies or maybe a dollar or something like that of that membership fee. We can get just a very small amount um, for only the individuals who are in our zip code area. The majority of our funds we do raise on our own through grants, through the SCFD uh, grants, grants, um, as well as through donors like you and from our program fees when we have fees for programs. We have a lot of different types of programs that we do. We have classes, we have birding field trip, um, field trips that we do, workshops, we go into schools and do programs into schools. If you have at any time participated in any of our programs, you're welcome to put a smile in the chat room and uh, let us know that you've attended one of these types of programs. We also provide research grants, which are open now. So if you know any uh, college professors, college students, grad students who are doing non-game wildlife research, we do have a grant available for that, and that is open right now um, and due in January. So you can, you can uh, let me know, and we can get that information to you. We also, we can only do all of these programs through the, with the volunteers that we have. We have over 150 volunteers, and tonight we are joined by four of our volunteers, Lori, Angela, Julia, and Mary, um, and they'll, they will be helping to lead our discussions that we have tonight. So thank you all very much for being here for the conservation program, our first conservation program. So this is one of my favorite birds. Go ahead and type into the chat if you know what kind of bird this is. And the reason I love this bird is because they're very bold, they're very brave, they never sit still, they're always flitting around the yard, busy foraging for food, uh, kind of like me, just keeping busy every minute of the day. And yes, you are correct, this is the house wren. And another one of the reasons I think I love them so much is that I monitor the nests. They've been nesting in my backyard for many, many years, and I monitor that nest every year. So I get to, to watch the babies be raised, I get to see the parents feeding them, um, and when they come out of the nest, the young are following the parents around, foraging together for a little while. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's very, very rewarding to have that firsthand experience with that bird. Um, one of the realities right now, though, is that the house wren, despite being a very common bird, is in danger. And under a worst case scenario, uh, it's possible that the house wren could lose 50% of its range. This is a prediction from National Audubon here. This shows the current range of the house wren. And the potential range loss is in the dark red under a 1.5 degree climate warming scenario and a three degree climate warming scenario. Um, so we're gonna talk about all of the different reasons that bird populations may be in decline. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about what birds do for us because birds actually do a lot for us. Birds are indicators of the environment. This quote here is from Roger Tory Peterson. He is famous for doing the Peterson Field Guides. How many of you, just give a little, you know, 
little smile or wave. Uh, I think in your participant screen, you might have the ability to give a thumbs up. But the Peterson Field Guides, um, he wrote those guides and um, he is uh, thought to be one of the founding inspirations for a 20th century environmental movement. And there's a lot of ways that birds make our lives better when it comes to science and conservation. Um, scientists routine, routine, routinely use birds to gauge the health of ecosystems. So some examples are in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, tree swallows were used to study the impact of toxins in the Great Lakes and Hudson River areas. Um, looms were studied to understand the impact of atmospheric mercury in New York, Aaron, uh, New York's Aaron, I never say that right, Adirond Adirondack Park. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different ways that studying the birds can help us understand something that might also be impacting human health. Additionally, um, birds have many other ecosystem services. An ecosystem service is where they're doing something that help the ecosystem, help the planet, help maybe what we're doing, our economy for instance, and we benefit from that without having to actually put money in. So the first is that habit, bird habitat supports clean water. Um, although riparian zones account for only for less than five percent of the southwestern landscape, birds do support, do um, the riparian, that's areas around rivers and lakes, the riparian areas support over 40% of all bird species. Um, so 40, and, and some estimates are even up as high as 60% of birds using those riparian areas around rivers. Um, so keeping those areas healthy for birds also keeps the water healthy for us because that is where we, especially in Colorado, are pulling our drinking water. Birds also having healthy habitat um, nature supports our health as well. There's some, a lot of studies that talk about physical health being improved, stress being reduced, um, testing scores for students being higher if they are exposed to nature. Birds are also good for the economy. Bird watching generates almost $100 billion in economic impacts in the United States. Um, there's one area that was studied around Lake Erie, M McGee Marsh. Um, over 100,000 birders go to McGee Marsh just to bird watch. And they're going there during the off season. So they're not going there in the summer when there's, you know, lake activities and they're not going there in the winter when there's skiing because I think they're skiing around that area. Um, they're going during the off season and one of the researchers at Bowling Green State University looked at how much they were spending in that around Lake Erie and found that they were generating 26 million dollars and created 283 jobs in 2011. So birds can be really good for the economy. Birds also are a great source of pest control. Um, birds benefit your beverages. Insect eating birds protect farm crops, including um, grapes for our wine, uh, coffee beans for our coffee. There's a coffee borer in Central and South America that really can only be controlled by the birds. Pesticides don't, because they bore into the bean, there's no way of treating it to prevent the insects from getting into the beans. It's the birds that are living down in that area that are helping to control that. And um, just a lot of stories about how birds have helped with the lumber, with Missouri Ozark white oaks, where the lumber is sought off after for furniture makers. Um, a lot of different ways they are doing pest control for us. Birds also, uh, bird habitat and nature areas boost property values. Um, one study showed that uh, being near the presence of birds in green space can increase property, property values up to $32,000. So that's a you know, pretty good thing to be living near. Um, they are also a cleanup crew and do recycling services for us. This is uh, particularly important in India because 
Hinduism prohibits the slaughter and consumption of cows. So when the cows die naturally out in the open, um, the vultures come in and clean it up just literally within hours. Um, one, one account was within a half an hour. Um, and when the number of vultures started declining due to other reasons, um, they started noticing that human disease started increasing because of the carcasses that were, that were not basically being eliminated within that short time period. Um, they are also, whoops, I forgot to put our little pictures in here. Sorry about that. They are also uh, good for seed dispersal. Um, so the white bark pine tree, their roots are, hold the soil in place, preventing erosion. Um, they, according to a professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, who's done a study, oh wait, she did a study on something else, but they, uh, the trees, do they help prevent avalanche? Um, it shades the snowpack so that melt in the spring is a little bit um, uh, more protected so that it's not that you don't get those springtime floods. And there's one particular bird that disperses the seeds. Does anybody know what that bird is? You can just type that into chat and I have a picture of it right here on the screen. Does anybody know that bird? Well, if you were thinking the Clark's Nutcracker, this is the Clark's Nutcracker. Um, they are uh, the main seed dispersal for the white bark pine. A matter of fact, it's the only seed dispersal, um, the only bird that does seed dispersal for the white bark pine. And a professor, the professor at the University of Colorado Denver estimated that their services um, are worth $800 to $1,000 per acre um, based on what it would, what it costs the, um, uh, the Forest Service to do a hand planting program. They actually, actually initiated a hand planting program and it costs about $800 to $1,000 per acre for, for them to do that program. So the Clark's Nutcracker is um, kind of a critical bird for uh, Colorado here. Another service that they have that we don't always think about is pollination. Some birds that drink nectar of flowers or hummingbirds can be pollinators as well. So let's go ahead and dive into the research and what we are seeing with birds. The first most, most publicized research this past year is the decline of American avifauna by Rosenberg, and they, it was published in Science in 2019 by researchers at seven institutions, and the findings were showing that, that 2.9 billion breeding adult birds have been lost since 1970, um, and that includes birds in every ecosystem. And this study uh, took into account population changes of 529 different birds that they studied. They were looking at 48 years of data from multiple sources, including um, breeding bird surveys, Christmas bird count, um, and they also used data from NEXRAD radar stations, where those stations can actually pick up the biomass in the air, and they used that, and, and both the NEXRAD data and the counts that they were using were in indicating the same number of decline in the number of individual birds. And the study shows that the losses threaten even some of our common and beloved birds. So um, that's an, another, and this is not something that's really that new. We've started seeing the signs many years ago. In 2016, um, the Partners in Flight Land Bird Conservation Plan showed a, a similar decline. So they studied populations of 448 species in the U.S. and Canada, and they were estimating that from 1970 to 2015, there was a loss of about a billion birds. Um, less than five years later, 
In 2019, the study is now showing 2.9 billion. So you can see that that line is really going down very quickly. Um, the land bird conservation plan also identifies watch list species, species that are the highest concern. Some of the Colorado birds include the Gunnison sage grouse, lesser prairie chicken, greater sage grouse, uh, greater prairie chicken, flammulated owl, gray vireo, and the scaled quail are some of the Colorado birds that are on that watch list. So what do you think is causing the decline in bird populations? What we're going to do right now is I want to have you go ahead and provide that information and have a discussion with a few other participants. So I'm going to break this entire group out into breakout rooms. So you'll be in a small room with um, just a few other attendees and our volunteer. A volunteer will be there with you. And the question is, what do you think is causing the decline? Each of you will have about a minute to share something that you think might be causing the decline. Um, and um, then when we come back, our volunteer will summarize the, the conversation that you had. So I'm going to stop my sharing. And go ahead and make sure that we have everybody split out. All right, and I will give you about five to six minutes. Yes. So if you want to go ahead and just accept the Oops, I forgot to hit record. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, and we're going to move into some of what we know is causing the um, reductions in bird populations. Susie, Mary had a question. Never mind. Oh, yes, Mary, go ahead. I was just going to say um, I live in Denver in Park Hill, which is northeast Denver. Um, my neighborhood specifically, we have a gang of about 10 cats that were feral um, what happened was one of the issues is that people will feed them thinking that they're helping it um, and then they you know just reproduce and it gets bigger and bigger um, so our we have a gang of about 10 that you know rules our block um, my mom will go yell at them when she can but one of our neighbors got them all spayed so hopefully that will um, calm it down but that's just my specific experience with it yeah, and as long as new cats don't start moving in, um, those numbers should start going down now that they're spayed and neutered. So um, hopefully you'll start seeing an improvement in that. Was it uh, hard to catch them, the feral cats? <laughs> yes, that was actually what I was involved in when I first moved to Denver was feral cat um, rescue and rehabilitation. And it's, it can be very challenging. <laughs> they're very smart. Um, so we're going to go ahead and look at some of the numbers that we know, and there's some numbers we don't know as well. These statistics come from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services on human-caused bird mortality. Um, a lot of these numbers are calculated based and estimated based on research studies. Um, but you can see that number one is what we were just discussing, and that is cats. But it's estimated that 2.4 billion birds die every year due to cats. This came from a study where they actually put little cameras on the cats to see what, what they were doing while they were free roaming. Um, and I think that part of that study also had to do with um, people reporting what the cats brought back as well for the cats that didn't have cameras. And that came up with a fairly large number, followed by collision. Um, we talked about window collisions in one of the groups. Um, so that is a real issue. Uh, collision with vehicles as well. Poisons that we discussed, pesticides in our group. So you guys are right on target with knowing some of the different things causing this. Um, collisions with electrical lines and communication towers and electrocutions from electrical lines. Um, followed by oil pits, um, and that's an industry where if the oil pits aren't covered properly, then the birds fly into it thinking it's water. Um, 
and collisions with land-based turbines. And then there's several different uh, causes that can't be counted, haven't necessarily been estimated. It's really hard to know what loss is um, from habitat loss and conversion because we don't always find the birds that are being lost or that are dying because they can't find the resources that they need in their habitats. Um, so this is again from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services um, and you know thinking about habitat loss. Uh, one another study that has been done specifically in Colorado is the second Colorado breeding bird atlas and um, they, that was showing that some of the more common birds their breeding success was declined. So habitat loss not only shows a decline in the, in the adults that are already living there but if the birds can't breed then over time the population will decline because they're not able to reproduce um, the, the individuals and have young. So this is the chickadee was showing from um, the years are from 1995 to 2012. Um, there was a decline of 14% in breeding. And the way the breeding bird atlas works is they look at possible breeding, meaning that the bird is present, that maybe it's singing. Probable is they see the birds carrying nesting material. Um, or doing their territorial songs or territorial actions and behaviors. And confirmed is that the, there's a nest confirmed. They either see a nest or they see them taking food to the young. Um, so that would be confirmed. And overall, chickadees were down 14%. They think that might have to do with the removal of dead trees, which is where chickadees nest. They, they nest in cavities. And sudden aspen death, which hit Colorado in 2006. So so those are some of the thoughts that might be causes of the declines for chickadees. The American robin, I mean, this is like a bird we think of as being everywhere. Um, and it was showing breeding down about 3%. And they think, again, that might have to do with food sources being declined with the berry crops. And uh, the yellow warbler, I threw this in here because we see this bird at our bird banding research station in the spring. And this is one where in Colorado, the numbers were up. Now nationwide, the numbers were down. So, you know, we don't know if that means that they're kind of altering where they're going as they're migrating and, and breeding, um, but our yellow warblers do breed here in Colorado. Um, and then some projections that are happening. One of the biggest report pro projections reports is survival by degrees, 389 bird species on the brink. And um, this is a study where, again, they took all the different data that has been gathered over time. And they also looked at, took some modeling, some clim and climate modeling and looking at climate and how climate is affecting the birds. A couple of groups mentioned climate. And Audubon Science is showing that nearly two thirds of North American bird species are at risk of extinction due to climate change. So um, they also, what are the next one? They also were looking at three different warming scenarios and some of the threats that affect the birds because the threats are changing based on the climate warming. And those threats for Colorado specifically, and this is something we've definitely seen this year, is fire weather being increased. Um, you can see how red the state of Colorado is here. So the red um, or the dark orange reddish color is showing an increase of that threat at one point uh, no, the, the yellow orange is 1.5 degrees Celsius and the red dark orange is a three degree. So you can see that at three degrees warming, that's um, really hitting Colorado hard. Extreme spring heat, which can affect the breeding of birds and young survival. Um, crop expansion, kind of hit and miss and through here. A little bit of spring droughts, um, some urbanization as well. Uh, and false springs. So those are some of the different um, dangers that increase when climate change overall is increased. So looking at warming scenarios, a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase is actually 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, that can be a pretty big number. 
um, we are, and this is looking at an increase over pre-industrial average. We are right now at about one degree warming in 2018, so that's actually two years old. The Paris Agreement goal is 1.5, which is why Audubon used that number. And um, they also looked at two degrees, which is uh, two degrees Celsius and three degrees Celsius. And three degrees Celsius is equivalent to 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, right now with current pledges and targets, we are um, scheduled to hit about 2.9 degrees Celsius change. And with current policies, um, we're looking at 3.2 degrees Celsius change. So, um, you know, in terms of climate, we need to start thinking about how we can bring that number down. Um, and then here's some of the range maps for some common birds in Colorado, the broad-tailed hummingbird at 1.5 degrees. Again, the dark red is range lost. The blue is range gained. Um, and here is what it would look like if it's at three degrees. For the robin, here's Colorado, more zoomed into Colorado at 1.5 and three degrees Celsius change. Um, and what this shows us looking at the difference is that if we take action now we can improve the chances for three quarters of the species that are considered at risk according to the modeling that national audubon has done and other organizations support this that partners in flight land bird conservation plan actually they say in their plan we know However, that when we use the best science to develop conservation plans and implement them, we can make a difference. Um, if any of you are interested, and Angela will share the uh, link for the birds, um, the 380 degree uh, survival by degrees link in our chat box, but you can go to their website, put your zip code in, and you can actually see information on the birds in your zip code area. So she can go ahead and share that via the chat. Um, and I think I missed having us share a couple of other things. Angela, sorry, but if you want to throw up the 380 or the survival by degrees, 385 species at risk link, that's where you can go to see um, what's happening with birds in your area and what's predicted to happen. Um, so what are some actions we can take to help birds? I'm gonna push us out into breakout rooms again. And um, that's the question that's posed to you is what are some of the actions that we can take to help the birds? This time, since we have a smaller group than I anticipated, I'm gonna give us um, about four to five minutes uh, as opposed to the six we had. So we're actually gonna have less time than you had last time. Um, but we are just going to do basically the same thing where we can have a few small group discussions. And I'm just opening the breakout rooms now and changing the settings. And I'm gonna go ahead and I think I've got our volunteers separated this time. Just confirming. And off we go. At the number of cats that were a problem. I, 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 and, and I just wish I knew more about the statistics on habitat loss. Yeah, that was very surprising. Well, Susie, you said you worked for the feral cat rescue? Because mm -hmm. there used to be a, a feral cat home on 6th Avenue. 
Yes. Yep. Um, and I, I had a patient that I would take there because she loved being around the feral cats. Mm -hmm. Oh. And she fed the feral cats that were in the back of the building. Uh -huh. um, so I know, I know how those feral cats were reproducing. Yes, yes. Um, and the rescue that I worked with, if, if, this, if it was not a dangerous situation for the cats, and this was before I got into birds and wildlife, but um, if it's not a dangerous situation for the cats and there is a caretaker to feed the cats, then the rescue group goes in, pulls as many cats as they can out, like in like a matter of a week or two. You try to get them all within a week or two um, to get them all spayed and neutered. Any cats that were tame or young enough to be tamed were placed into foster homes and the truly feral cats were then spayed, neutered, and put back with the person who was caretaking them outdoors. Um, and then over time, the numbers, of course, would start to go down because they weren't reproducing. And yeah, there's a, as somebody mentioned in the chat room, um, there's a lot of dangers out there for cats. So they live a very, very short life. They really only live two to three years when uh, they're feral. Oh. Um, wow. and, uh, but in that two to three years, cats are prolific enough that they can, I, I forget what the number is, I probably have the book right here actually from back then, but, um, in, they, in two to three years, they can create way more cats than, you know, they can have two litters a year. Um, so yeah, they reproduce very, very quickly. So, so the, they more than replace themselves. Yes, they yes. do. They sure do. Yeah. If yep. we were ranking the most significant um, threats to bird populations, what would be at the top, and where do the where do um, cats come in that ranking? You know, it's hard because of habitat loss, and but there's so many factors, uh, and we're going to go into that next. Is what can we do? Um, but yeah, there's so many factors with the, the habitat loss, and, and that would include the loss of food sources, including insects, um, mm -hmm. cats, but cats is the number one, you know, known number. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't put a number on habitat loss, so it's uncertain. Okay. So actions, did you guys come up with some actions for improving <laughs> the odds yeah. for our birds? <laughs> oh, gosh. What do you think, Tom? What's one thing we can do? <laughs> Put out bird seed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm cats, all for that. Cats indoors. <laughs> yeah, leave the cats, cats indoors. Problem. That's right. <laughs> I quit washing my windows to reduce the risk of bird strikes. Yes. That's a good Well, good we've, we've put yeah. stickers on ours, and we're not sure it makes any difference. I put stickers on them, but I cleaned them, and cleaning was a mistake. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So, it, it makes them more reflective, so it, it mirrors the habitat. So when the birds are flying around, they see trees and sky, yeah. and they fly into it. And that's why they hit so hard, is because they're like, oh, I'm going to head over there to that bush. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, something that Kate said this summer was that when you look at your plants, you should see, if you see as as much as 10% eaten, it's okay. Yes. That means that there's a lot of good insects there. If there's too much more than that, maybe you want to look at control. Yes. But it's okay to have 10%. And mm -hmm. so I've also gotten much more relaxed about... Welcome back, everybody. I know we got cut off and we're having a pretty heated conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure some of you probably had that happen to you as well. So just real quick, let's go through and hear um, our groups. Julia, you want to start? Well, we talked about feral cats and what, how big of um, an impact do they actually have and what can we do to control them. We talked about feeding the birds. I think that's a good thing. If they're losing their food sources, we can at least provide some supplemental feeding. Um, and some ways to protect, to reduce the risk of bird strikes on our windows, whether it's stickers or um, there's some, some other things that they talked about yesterday um, at a different conference that I'm still investigating that might reduce bird strikes. 
So that's what we had. Susie, you're, you're muted. Sorry, Angela. Okay, but we had um, native, um, Tony suggested that we need to plant more native plants and have less grass. Um, she uses rain barrels to make use of natural water rather than um, piped mm -hmm. water. Stickers on windows to um, prevent deaths by birds flying into windows. Um, Kate spoke about the community level, like um, in Parker, a new mayor is going to be elected and she wants to talk about sustainability. Um, like HOAs, what are they going to do about um, being sustainable and encouraging pollinators? And when, when um, cities are planning um, the layout, they can think about birds and natural habitats because often, as Kate said, people didn't think of it. And I'm sure if people thought of it, they'd want it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Lori, your group. Okay, so, um, well, voting was a big, big item and Proposition 2A in Denver is actually, it's, it's Denver's um, taking some responsibility for what the city can do about climate change. In particular, we talked about uh, emissions from garbage trucks. So as a city, you have the ability to determine, you know, what kind of emissions your vehicles have. Uh, and, and the city can set goals, which are gonna work to help reduce climate change. Um, bird habitat is really important in our yards. So Lori's saying she turned her whole backyard into a bird habitat. She actually used the Audubon website, which lists plants that are native plants that are good for birds. Um, really important. Uh, what we plant is really important. Um, grow, uh, buying coffee that is shade grown is one thing that Donna learned about. And you can get that at Trader Joe's. And I, I know our conservation committees talked a little bit about that. So I, I think it's something that Audubon might be promoting. The other concern was the number of birds that are flying into windows, and we we're wondering uh, what can be done about that, for example, in apartment buildings. Uh, but Susie, I know that you know about the group, uh, the conservation committee knows about the group that walks the streets early in the morning to determine how many trees are flying into the buildings because the lights are on, and I thought maybe you could share some information about that. And then in my community, in my HOA, we're replacing uh, a lot of the Kentucky bluegrass with something called dog tough turf so that when it's established, it doesn't have to be mowed, rarely has to be watered, um, and it's very sustainable. So those are some of the things we talked about. Thank you, Mary. What did your group discuss? Um, so we talked a little bit about um, some things that have been mentioned um, as far as individual actions, trying to stay away from pesticides and fertilizers. Um, trying to do as much native plant landscaping as we can. Um, we talked a little bit, some of us were surprised to see that cats were that number one cause on there. Um, Jan was not coming from Hawaii, that is a big issue there, um, which is really interesting. I think, you know, historically that's been kind of what happens as we, you know, go and colonize new places is the cats would just escape and you know that's how most of the original flightless birds were um you know just decimated but um you know how the potential for just greater reaching educational campaigns to get people to understand why they shouldn't just let their cat roam free could be you know an individual or community level action um and then we also talked about ways to eliminate the window strikes from birds. Um, so Becky said that she's heard some different opinions and different recommendations. So again, we would um, see what you think as far as if there's one particular thing that works better than other things to make windows not seem so reflective and, and help that not be such a big problem. Perfect, thank you. I'm, I think you all could just teach this class yourselves. <laughs> Because I think you, everybody here has mentioned everything else I'm going to be sharing for the remainder of today's program. Um, 
So let me go ahead and head back to our presentation um, and just mention, you know, one of the, the other takeaway National Audubon had is that we do already know what we need to do to help protect the birds and the places that they live. Um, we, we know what to do, so it's time to do it. And um, uh, I kind of added the second bullet point, which is taking personal actions at home, in our workplaces, and in our communities. Um, and then urging action at state and federal levels. So today's program is focusing on the personal actions that we can take at home and in our communities. Uh, so let's go into that. This, this class today and this series for this year is based on the Three Billion Birds Project, which came out of that 2019 science report. Uh, they identified seven actions that are simple actions that anybody can take in their homes and um, are promoting these seven simple actions. So that's what we're going to focus on. Um, this whole year, I'm doing one conversation or one lecture per month, bringing in some experts on some of these different topics. So I'll let you know when those are and what we'll be discussing. And then two topics that we're not getting to in that much depth, I'm going to talk about in more detail here. So again, we know how to use the best science to develop conservation plans, and it has been successful. Um, the types of birds that have increased over the last 50 years have been raptors. There's been a gain in raptors, 15 million raptors gained. There's also been a gain in waterfowl because of waterfowl conservation efforts, thanks to places like Ducks Unlimited, the duck stamps, eliminating lead in waterfowl hunting has decreased lead toxicity in our waterfowl and our waterways. So we can bring the birds back. We just need to start thinking about what actions we need to take to do that. So um, I don't know, yes, it uh, looks like, like Angela shared this, but this is one of the places you can go to. The website is Three Billion Birds, and um, you can help the seven actions that they're doing that we're going to talk about. One is making windows safe. A lot of you talked about making windows safe, and we're going to bring an expert in in March to talk about making windows safe. Just briefly here, a couple of bits of information. Um, <coughs> and 599. Um, million birds are thought to die every year due to building and window collisions. And there are several cities that are doing studies to go out, search for the birds, including downtown Denver. That's called Lights Out Denver. And in March, we have um, the intern who is running that program right now is going to be coming and talking to us in March, giving us some more details about that program, giving us some details about um, the statistics and the research on um, bird loss due to, due to building and window strikes. And these are just a few things that you can do. We talked about windy, window decals. Um, you can buy products to put on the outside of your window because usually it's that reflection that they're seeing. Um, there's a few indoor treatments that can help depending on the time of day and the lighting, but um, there's feather friendly tape a copian bird savers, window film, bird screens. Julia mentioned that she got a whole list of things from um, our contact with National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL. And if you are replacing your windows, there's uh, certain types of glass that have been built specifically to be bird friendly that can be installed. Um, and another option is just making sure the windows that you install have screens over the entire window. Um, that's what I did in this house and it drastically reduced the bird strikes on some of the windows we had here. But we'll go into more details of the research and what you can do, what some of those different products are during our conversation in March. Um, we talked a lot about keeping cats indoors and the impact that cats have and we have somebody coming to talk to us in February about cats. And again, a few bits of information, reminder, 2.4 billion birds killed by domestic cats, and it's estimated that 31% um, of that is by domestic owned mm. cats, which means that the feral cats is the other almost 60%. Um, so that's a pretty big number. Um, 
the good news is we can keep cats indoors. They can live a perfectly healthy life indoors. I know many, many people who have indoor cats who are, are doing just fine with the appropriate toys and activities indoors. And um, you can allow your, out, your cat outdoors in controlled situations either with a leash, this is one of our employees, cats that she used to have, was leash trained, and um, go ahead and check out Adventure Cats. That is a whole website dedicated to having adventures and hiking and traveling with cats in a controlled situation to keep the cats safe. I was really amazed at this website and all the different things people are doing with their cats that you'd think of is just for dogs, but no, <laughs> they're taking them hiking and, and all kinds of places. It's really fascinating. Um, so we'll be talking about, again, the more details on the statistics and the actions and, and what's happening in February. Less lawn and planting natives. I'm going to go into more detail uh, into that today because I do not have a conservation and Colorado lecture focused on that. However, in the spring, our outreach coordinator, Kate Hogan, who is joining us tonight, um, she will be having several programs specifically on native plants. She is a Habitat Hero Ambassador and has been trained on, um, that, on what we can do to help birds with native plants. And uh, she'll be doing some classes in the spring. But I'll go into a little bit of detail today. And as we mentioned, our backyards are part of the larger landscape. Somebody mentioned that in the breakout rooms. Um, and this is kind of a typical looking high housing density suburb. Uh, on average, the American yard covers, um, the lawn covers more than half the yard and the remaining area covered by trees, flowers, and shrubs are frequently introduced species. I mean, think about how many plants in your yard have the word Japanese in it, Russian, sage. You know, they're, they, they're not native to Colorado and the birds and the insects that live here are not adapted to knowing how to get food from that source. Um, and the landscape as we know it, while you know, we, we look at it and say, oh, this is so beautiful, look at all the green space, and, and it's really a social thing. Historically, lawns were a status symbol where the rich and famous would create huge expanses of lawns to show how much money they had and how much time they had on their hands to be able to have this big expanse of lawn that, that needed so much care. And yeah, we're spending hours of time every week caring for these lawns. So, you know, it's time to start thinking about how can we change what that landscape looks like in a way that's beneficial to the birds. And looking at it from the bird's point of view, as they're flying over, what are they seeing? If, if they're seeing a lot of lawns, they're not seeing a place where they're going to find shelter, where they're going to find food. Um, a lot of our birds are migrating through the Colorado area. Um, and we want to make sure that we can provide some habitat for them throughout their lives, whether they're just passing through, whether they're down from the mountains um, for just the winter months, like our juncos and our um, uh, white crowned sparrows, or are they breeding in our yards like our uh, wrens and our chickadees? So habitat for wildlife, all wildlife needs water, food, shelter, and space. There are four types of food that birds find useful, and if we can provide that with our plants, then we're going to be providing more food for more types of birds than just our feeders provide. We always think of feeders and seeds, that's pretty obvious, but there's a lot of native plants like sunflowers, coneflowers, etc., that provide seeds for our birds. And um, it's okay to be a lazy gardener. Don't deadhead the flowers in the fall. If you need to deadhead them, wait until the spring. I've been watching birds out here eating the seeds from the coneflowers just in the last couple of weeks. So providing seeds with plants is a really beneficial thing for the birds. It's also giving them a nice variety of types of seeds. Berries is a second type of food that we don't always think about, but providing um, three-leaf sumac, also known as skunk bush sumac or lemonade sumac, um, providing uh, choke cherries. Uh, berries are a good food source through the winter months as well. And our robins, um, they are short distance migrants. So our Colorado robins will frequently migrate 
a little bit south and then the ones that are up in Canada are kind of coming towards us here and they're eating the berries off of the trees in the winter months. Nectar, of course, is good not just for our birds, but also for other pollinators as well. This is a picture of bee balm with a hummingbird feeding on that. Penstemon, a lot of people know about penstemon. And this is really a critical source of food, and that is our insects. Caterpillars are baby bird food. Um, most people don't realize that even birds that we think of as being seed eaters or nectar eaters, they feed their young insects. They're not feeding them nectar, they're not feeding them seeds. Um, a couple of species do create a milk um, from the seeds that they eat, but that's just like a couple of finch species and I think maybe the doves. And the rest of the birds are chickadees, um, our nut hatches. Uh, those birds are feeding their young caterpillars primarily, but also um, grubs and beetles and flies. So having native host plants for the insects is also going to increase that insect food. And also native host plants, native plants are more resistant to pests. They um, have, have, have grown and evolved over time with those insects. So a native plant can defend itself against a native insect. Um, now that's a whole nother story that we could get into with, with invasive insects, um, but native host plants like the uh, butterfly milkweed, and unfortunately my screen is kind of covering the name of this other plant. Hopefully you can see that. Um, Another thing to provide is the water. Uh, water will bring all types of birds to your yard. The seed eaters, the berry eaters, the insect eaters, all of them. Um, and some people say if you can't put out a feeder, put out a bird bath because that water is still gonna bring those birds in. Um, shelter is also something and our native plants do provide really good shelter for our native birds. Trees and shrubs, um, if you can have space and put out dead logs and brush piles, I actually, I have a small yard, but I threw some just some things that I had trimmed and created a small brush pile behind against the fence behind uh, a um, uh, the choke cherries. And I found that the whole summer, and I was like, okay, I need to get rid of that brush. But the whole summer, the wrens that were nesting in my yard, they were using it. They were going in there, foraging in there, using it as shelter. And I was like, huh, okay. Maybe I'm not getting rid of that brush pile after all. Thank goodness it's behind the bush. <laughs> um, but if that's something that you can have in your yard, it's actually beneficial. Again, being a lazy gardener is a good thing for the birds. Um, I don't have to figure out what to do with that brush pile. I can just kind of leave it there. <laughs> and you can also provide covered platforms for them to come out of the storm. This is a native tree called a hackberry, which is actually good for um, a good landscaping tree. It's not quite as messy as the cottonwoods or the box elder trees um, and it provides food for them as well. It's also called the western hackberry or the net leaf hackberry um, and conifers are really good for Colorado birds as well. And creating space and making sure that the feeder, if you have feeders, that they're close to shelter options, placing perches and feeders at all different levels, and you can use hardscaping as well um, to layer your yard. And somebody mentioned this as well. Again, you could have taught this class. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, Native Plants for Birds is another link that we have available to you. Um, that is, let me see. Yeah, it's Plants for Your Area, um, Plants for Birds database, www.audubon.org, Plants for Birds, where you type in your zip code, and it's gonna give you a list of birds that are good for this area and also good for the birds. And the added benefit is it tells you what type of birds each of those plants might bring in. So if you're looking for plants to bring in a cer certain type of bird that's your favorite, um, you can look for that in the Plants for Birds database. So definitely use that as you're thinking about planting choices. Um, so again, future programs Kate will be doing in the spring. I will share that with uh, everybody who's registered for this program. Um, 
pesticides was mentioned in a couple of different groups as well. And we are going to have an expert come and talk to us about pesticides, giving us some information. Um, we know that pesticides affect the insects, and there have also been studies showing that there's a great decrease in insect populations as well. Several studies about that, and some call it the windshield effect. You know, 20 years ago, we had a lot more insects hitting our windshields and our, and our um, headlights on the front of our cars than we have today. It's, it's noticeable. Um, and that indirectly is affecting the birds because birds are feeding those insects to the young. So some things that you can do at home is eating organic or non-GMO is something that you can do that affects, that, that, that puts that impact into our economy as well because a lot of the farmers and agricultural areas that are that are creating organic are often providing space for birds in other ways as well with their other holistic practices that they need to put in place to be able to sustain um, organic farming uh, and reduce the pesticides with some of those other practices that they have. Um, and then and, and using less pesticides in your home. Julia mentioned the, the 10, the, the rule of 10, and that, that is you step back 10 feet and look at the plant. You, you know, you have plant damage and pest damage, step back 10 feet, look at the plant. And if, you, if, if the, it's 10% or less damage and you can't see the damage when you're 10 feet back, then you probably don't need to apply anything uh, that that plant is going to be okay. So we'll again talk more about that at our program in April. The next of the seven simple things is drinking shade grown coffee, which again, you all mentioned. I think everything on this list was mentioned in your groups. Coffee, uh, how does that help birds? Well, a lot of the birds that nest here or travel through here, they're going to Central and South America to spend their winter months. Our yellow warbler that breeds in Chatfield State Park, um, they are going down to Central America and they are going to be in the different forests that are in that area. And those forests, if, if the coffee is shade grown, that means they're being grown under the canopy of those trees. Uh, and there's some sort of tree or some type, sort of canopy that is there for the birds to use as space, shelter, and a place to forage as well. So looking for uh, bird-friendly coffees. Uh, we'll, we are doing that presentation in November, just in time for the holidays. So if you have some coffee and chocolate lovers, um, come to that talk and we will talk about how um, Shade Grown helps the birds and uh, some of the different types of brands that you might be able to find and what to look for, for both coffee and chocolate. Um, so looking at that for chocolate. Um, Plastic is the next one. We do not have a lecture for plastic. Uh, I'm going to cover that in more detail today as well. But using less plastic, well, how does that help the birds? Does anybody have any ideas before I do my presentation, let you do some talking? You can put it in chat, type it into chat, or unmute yourself and toss out an idea. Well, somebody mentions, does Keurig have bird-friendly coffee? And that kind of ties right into my plastics conversation um, because if you can't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm actually not a coffee drinker. Um, however, Keurig does have pods that are dishwasher safe that you can use instead. So you just buy the bag of coffee um, like you would for a coffee pot and you put the amount in the little um, reusable container that goes in the Keurig. It does its coffee thing and then you just rinse it out. You can put it in the dishwasher. Um, so yes, you can actually find uh, a solution for our single coffee Keurig machines as well. And I'm seeing a lot of different uh, comments. And yes, plastics found in the stub stomachs of birds on Midway Island Avoiding plastics definitely helps because it prevents bird ingestion and entanglement. And I hear somebody has unmuted. Do you want to mention something? Okay, so, um, so yeah, the obvious is that birds can get entangled in 
plastics, right? The bag that's flying around, it's possible for them to get tangled in that. They can get tangled in fishing line, especially here in Colorado. Um, but the, and we might think, well, I don't put my stuff into the environment. I put it into my trash can. So it's not going out into the environment where birds can get entangled. However, landfills, until they are covered over and sealed, they are completely exposed to wildlife and wind to take some of those plastics out of that area. We visited, um, De uh, Denver Audubon staff visited a landfill and composting facility. Um, I think it was Alpine Waste, maybe. Uh, Kate can correct me if I'm wrong. And yeah, and until they get the space, that hole in the ground filled, it doesn't get covered over. Um, and I don't remember, I think they gave us a number about how long it takes for um, them to, to fill a space and move on to the next one. So the plastics that we put in our landfill can still get out into the environment. Um, also landfills themselves um, re release methane, which is a greenhouse gas. And the EPA estimates that landfills are the third leading cause of methane emissions in the United States. So contributing to landfill is contributing to climate issues. So um, doing other options by using reusable. I saw a lot of people mentioning um, uh, using reusable bags and reusable plastics is definitely a solution that's keeping things out of the landfill. Um, composting is another solution for keeping things out of the landfill. And additionally, um, plastic bottles are a petroleum product. So we are basically taking the carbon out of the earth where it's sequestered and confined and moving it through our system to potentially be um, contributing to climate and pollution. So plastic bottles, when we talk about the plastic water bottle, I'm sure all of you have seen this about uh, to produce one plastic bottle is, takes about a quarter of a bottle of oil and then like three or three and a half bottles of water in the production process of creating the bottle and filling the bottle. And um, according to carbonfootprint.com, a mass of 50% of the plastic we use is single use and can't be used again. Well, what about recycling? Um, yes, recycling is a great thing. And according to EcoCycle, I think it was EcoCycle, let me just look at it. Yes, according to EcoCycle, uh, recycling does occur. And it does occur on a great basis. However, we are really getting to the point where we don't have a plastics recycling problem, we have a plastics production problem. What Ecosystem said, is that uh, recycling um, is more difficult now because of record low oil prices. It's actually more affordable to create a new bottle than it is to recycle it. So, you know, the consumer has to pay more for a recycled bottle, basically recycled plastics. Um, the lack of companies using recycled plastics to make their products is a concern. The recycling companies are wanting to sell these plastics, um, but there's not a lot of buyers out there. Um, so, so there's kind of a, a supply and demand issue happening with our recycling materials right now. And then NPR reporting just recently has been talking about the history of recycling and how recycling was actually promoted and the advertising paid for by the plastics companies and the industry to basically convince people that plastic is a good thing and it can be reused, which it can. Um, but we kind of are running into this, this ceiling right now with the oil prices being low and the lack of companies purchasing recycled plastics to make their products. Um, so that's what's going on with recycling. So here are some solutions. Um, bottled water costs over 2,000 times more than tap water. Um, can you imagine paying 2,000 times more for a hamburger? Um, so why are we paying 2,000 times more for, for water? A lot of the bottled water that we purchase is nothing but filtered tap water from whatever city that 
uh, factory is located in. Now there are some bottled waters that are actually spring water. Um, and tap water, there's always a lot of concern over tap water, but tap water in the United States, if you're not living in an old home or an old neighborhood, your tap water is safe. Um, it's uh, definitely um, gone through processes, it gets tested frequently. So, you know, filtering your tap water, if you are in a neighborhood that might be questionable about the types of pipes leading up there, we know for a fact that Denver Water is working really hard to change those pipes out in neighborhoods and in homes themselves, even though it's technically owned by the property owner. Um, so that is, cha that change is coming as well. Um, so save your money and drink tap water. Uh, reusable storage. Um, this is a photograph of a lot of different reusable storage, um, reusable straws. So I have some different straws here that are made out of metal and silicone. Silicone is actually a sand or glass product. It's not made, even though it has some of the properties of plastic or rubber, it's actually um, made from glass and, and sand. So silicone storage bags are there kind of in the center. Um, there's also some cloth storage bags there instead of our plastic bags. Um, you can get bees wax wrap instead of plastic wrap. Um, word of warning, it works better on glass than it does uh, plastic bowls, but um, I do use that and it does work. You can also, chew, oh, and I, I brought with me, I've got a produce bag here, produce bag, um, and shopping bags as well, or, or reusable products that you can use. Um, you can choose products when you are shopping, choose products in glass, metal, cardboard, or no packaging. The little image all the way to the right there is where I, before the pandemic, a little hard to do right now, but went to the bulk section, reusable bulk bag that I put my nuts and candies in, and then I brought it home and put it into jars, canning jars, and in addition to not using plastics for those materials, um, it really made my pantry look really beautiful, like a, you know, a show home, <laughs> with, with the jars of nuts and candies in the glass containers, quite beautiful. <laughs> So, um, and then look for containers that are made from recycled materials. If there is a demand for it, then the industry is going to produce it. So if you have a choice between a recycled material, you can look for things that have, you know, a certain percentage of post-consumer recycled material. Um, choose that over other items. So those are all different things that you can do um, at home to reduce plastic. Um, so the last thing you can do is watch birds and share what you see. Some of the reports that we have that where we know what's happening with the birds come from community science projects, community citizen science projects where people are going out watching the birds and sharing that information with databases, databases like eBird, um, going on bird counts. We don't know yet if our Christmas bird count is happening, but we always have a Christmas bird count um, that happens uh, around December 25th through January 1st. Uh, go on some of those bird counts and help collect the data that we can learn so we can learn more about the birds. iNaturalist, Nest Watch is what I use for my, my bird nests. So we will be talking about that at our January program. And he will be talking specifically about eBird and looking at some of the more advanced features of eBird. So for those of you who are like, oh, I already use eBird on my phone, he's gonna go into some of the more advanced features to help you figure out where to go birding, what the hot spots are, um, you know, when the rare bird sightings and go into some of that information in January for eBird. So some seven simple actions, we provided the link for you so you can go to that website and learn more about it. This comes from National Audubon saying climate action today means a better chance for birds tomorrow and I would change that to personal action today means a better chance for birds tomorrow. So let's, to make a lasting change in the world, we can start right here. We can share that information with our friends and family. 
Um, so simply here again, here's that website for simple, simple actions to help the birds. Um, if you are interested in legislative, the series is not talking about legislation um, primarily, although it might be mentioned at some of our programs. But if you are interested in what's happening federally with legislation and how it affects the birds, you can sign up for action alerts with National Audubon. And these are three bills that are currently in the House or the Senate that affect birds. Um, so you can go and look for those Migratory Bird Protection Act of 2020. The uh, Bird Safe Buildings Act is looking at bird safe building practices with windows and, and bird strike types of protections on federal buildings that are built going forward, plan, being planned and built in the future. And then the Better Energy Storage Technology Act is providing research and development funds for uh, battery storage so that the solar panels have you know, on a really sunny day where we may not be using a lot of it, electricity, um, looking at batteries and how we can improve battery systems to, to save that power for longer times, uh, periods of time, and um, just to have some really good storage options. Um, and then coming to the Conservation in Colorado lecture series, here it is again, the Bird Friendly Coffee and Chocolate, um, Birding for Yourself in Science, Happy Cats, Healthy Birds, Build, making buildings bird safe, bird friendly in Denver, and pesticides and birds. And I'm wondering, are there any questions that I did not answer in the last 15 to 20 minutes? You can raise your hand and be called on, and I'm going to unshare for just a moment so I can see Questions, anybody, or questions in the chat that I haven't been able to monitor as closely. So is there anything that we did not discuss that I missed? Okay, it looks like I hit on everything, at least a little bit. Um, so, uh, so I shared with you that one of my favorite birds is the house wren. And I actually made a resolution for 2020 when we're like all making our new year's resolution. I was like, this is the year I'm gonna reduce my use of plastics and single use everything. So I went out and bought cloth paper towels and cloth napkins and plastic containers, or not plastic containers, um, the silicone containers to replace the plastic bags that I was using. Um, in January, I also started in the role of conservation coordinator for Denver Audubon. So I'm kind of figuring out where is Denver going to take our conservation messages moving forward. Um, and how can we create a bird friendly metro area in the in Denver metro area. So I want to thank all of you for coming to this program. You are being a part of that effort by coming to this program and coming to future programs and, and taking action. So my suggestion for you when you're taking action is start with things that make the most sense for you. Um, it doesn't make sense to change everything at once. So of these seven actions, what's easiest for you to attain in the next week, the next month, the next couple of months? And start there. Start with something that makes sense for you. Because once that becomes habit, you can go back to that list and think about something else that you can then add in to make a difference. So what actions are you going to take? If you want to go ahead and put those in chat, you are welcome to do that. Uh, I am going to go ahead and conclude because we are out of time, but I want to let you know you can also support BIRDS by joining our bi-weekly email communications where we'll share programs and information about what's happening with the BIRDS there. You can also become a local supporter of Denver Audubon. As I mentioned earlier, we are not funded by the national organization, we self-fund. So if you go to our website, you can make a donation that funds this program as well as other education programs. Um, and if you do make a donation because of this program today, just put conservation in Colorado in there so we can kind of track where, um, where our supporters are coming from. 
Um, and then some upcoming programs coming up. Coffee with a Corvid is on Saturday, November 7th with Nature's Educators, bringing one of their birds to share um, some of uh, information about Corvids, which are jays, ravens, and those smart birds. We have our fall celebration happening on Thursday, November 12th. Uh, where we'll be talking a little bit about what Denver Audubon has accomplished, where we're moving towards, and then we have a guest speaker talking about Aldo Leopold's writing and his impact on conservation today. And then we are uh, partnering with Denver field ornithologists and looking at bringing you uh, information on the Partners in Flight database, which I mentioned earlier in this program. So those are some things that you can look for on our webpage. Um, under our events. So thank you all. I will hang out for just a couple of minutes in case anybody has any questions or comments that they want to run by me um, before they leave. But this is the end of the program. So thank you very, very much for being here tonight. Are all of those virtual, Susie?